Okay. Uh, welcome once again to uh, the course on healing and deliverance. Hope you guys are all doing well. Thanks for joining in. Uh, let's get started with a word of prayer. And um, can I quickly request Azele Dolly, do you mind just leading us off uh, with a word of prayer, please? Okay, sure, Pastor. Let, let us pray. Father God, we come before your presence in the name of Jesus. Uh, but we thank you so much for this uh, beautiful morning that you have blessed us as we begin our session. I pray for our pastor. I thank you for the grace uh, that you have given to him to teach us this morning. And also want to thank you for each one of us who have joined. And also uh, I pray for our, our other friends who are going to join that everything will be all right, the network will, will be clear, and everyone will be, attend, will be able to attend the class, Lord. And the Holy Spirit, you lead us and you teach us, Lord. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Zelda. Um, okay, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Right. Uh, so as that comes uh, up in the meanwhile, um, so we've finished um, nine chapters, chapter nine, um, from chapter one to chapter nine. And um, as I mentioned in the last class, uh, chapters 11, tw uh, sorry, chapters 10, 11, and 12 uh, will be co covered in other courses, okay? That is in BC 112, um, we'll cover which you guys are already doing, which is believers' authority, demonology, and deliverance. Um, that chapter 10 and 11 will be covered in that. And then in a wholeness, that's chapter 12, uh, will be covered uh, in the next semester, I think. Yeah. Um, so that's that. And uh, which uh, now is, is leading us into chapter 13 the local church as a healing and delivering um, community. Uh, now, if we are able to finish uh, the next three chapters today, uh, which means today will be our, uh, uh, our last gathering as a class. And um, so we will not be having, we will not be meeting. So let's see if we are able to go through this portions today. Um, but yeah, okay. I hope you guys are all well and I hope you guys are ready. Um, so let's go, let's take from chapter 13. Uh, it talks about the local church as a healing and delivering community. The local church as a healing and then delivering community. Okay. Um, and as you can see, it's highlighted as well. One of the greatest desires of, of God's heart is to dwell among his people. He desires to have a people through whom his glory will be manifested on the earth. Okay, just think about those lines. God's heart is to dwell among his people. His desire to have a people through whom uh, his glory will be manifested on the earth. Uh, it's so humbling and, and in so many levels to know that uh, he wants us that he wants to flow through us. And then he wants to make known his glory uh, through us, his people, uh, right? Just look at the first sentence. God, his heart is to dwell among his people. Uh, it, it, those words, right? His people, um, um, my, my flesh and my blood, uh, my kin, it's all related uh, to when you're referring to your family, your kin, like your blood brother, your, you know, that's how it is. So it's so intimate. It's not just saying his people, okay, you know, the nation of Israel. It's not just random thought, but it's super intimate, right? It's like uh, we are his and, and he is ours. And if you read from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, one of the recurring themes Time and time and time again. You can even probably Google this, uh, you know, this verse where God says time and time again that I will be your God, you will be my people. Or you will be my people and I will be your God. It, just Google it and you'll be amazed uh, at the times 
that verse comes up, that though, that sentence, that statement keeps coming up. Uh, and so that is his heart. And that was his heart from the time of creation. It's, you know, going back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, when he created everything that he created. And then, uh, then he, you know, in the Garden of Eden, where he, he, he puts uh, man and, and his wife, Adam and Eve, in the garden. Uh, and then, you know, just, just ho holding on to the thought, the Garden of Eden, and then when you look at the tabernacle of Moses and later on the temple that Solomon builds eventually, uh, we see so much, so many similarities between the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle of Moses. So um, why am I even talking about it? Let's just give it a minute. Um, the entrance to the tabernacle of Moses was on the east, eastern side. And then when you read in Genesis chapter 2, uh, you'll see the entrance to the Garden of Eden was also east. Okay. And then you see uh, the tree of life. It's again very symbolic to the golden lampstand in the holy place. Not the most holy place, but the holy place, right? The inner courts. And um, and, and in the Garden of Eden, uh, in, as the narration goes, you see there's a river that is flowing out and I forget um, this. Um, oops, sorry. Um, let me just get my. So there's a river that flows out from the Garden of Eden, right? You guys remember that? Uh, and then if we just quickly read. Uh, let me see if I can get that verse. Psalm forty-six. Um, Psalm forty-six, verse four. Psalm 46, verse 4. I'll paste it in the chat section. Just in case. It's, uh, it's Psalm 46, verse 4. It says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Okay? There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation, the holy habitation of the Most High. It's like a dwelling place, his resting place, okay? Now, why am I saying that? So in the Garden of Eden, there is this river that you know, talks about flowing from the Garden of Eden, and then it, it, it kind of divides itself into four tributaries, and one of the tributaries is, flows into the land of Pishon, uh, right? And it says that is the land of pure gold, aromatic and precious stones okay look at that pure gold aromatics and precious stones all of these three elements are associated with the temple right and it is in the garden of eden where he walked in the cool of the garden and that's where he met you know uh, with adam and he and they fellowship they had this conversation you know and so that's where he dwelt so the garden of eden was god's dwelling place on earth that's where he would meet with mankind. But what happens after the fall is that they were separated, right? They were disconnected from his spirit. So our history says approximately the timeline between the fall and, and somewhere in, the cha uh, in Exodus chapter 25. So for that, that the gap there is about 2,500 years, more or less. Okay, from the time of the fall in Genesis 3, to Exodus 25. Why Exodus 25? Because it is that is where God tells Moses, make them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. So for 2,500 years since the fall, there was no resting place or a dwelling place for God. From the beginning, the heart of God was always to be in the midst of his people. Right? And then later on, uh, when we will read the scripture once again. That's Psalm 22, verse 3, but I'll, I'll refer, it to, refer to it anyways. It says, he is enthroned on the praises of his people. He is in the midst of his people. Right? He's in the midst of his people. So um, I, I hope you guys are with me. Um, you know, God's heart is to dwell. Right? The other word for dwell is tabernacle. And I pitch a tent, be in the middle of his people. 
Okay, um, so God's heart is to dwell among his people. He desires to have a people through whom his glory will be manifested on the earth. The local church is to become a community through which his glory will be released. Each local church is to become a healing and a delivering community, releasing God's glory to the world around. Amen. Um, so let's... Uh, dive in deeper and uh, see what this chapter has to teach us hosting the presence of god as a community hosting the presence of god as a community um, imagine a local community of believers among whom god dwells among whom god tabernacles among whom god rests Imagine what our local churches would be like if we made him and his presence our central focus. Imagine if we didn't make it about the politics and about the denominations, about our doctrines and what we understand, which is all important, by the way, is, you know, which is not only about music and, and the stage and the lights and the setup and how huge our auditoriums are, how small our auditoriums are. If, if we were not fixated on those, on those things and made him, his presence, a central focus. Imagine how it would be like. Because it is possible to do church and pretend like everything is well without his presence. Right? Just like uh, during the times of Jesus, uh, when the Ark of the Covenant was captured uh, during the time of Jeremiah, uh, where Jeremiah tries to hide it, and then the Babylonians, you know, uh, it was it was hidden from the Babylonians. But for a long time, the Israelites, uh, more so the the priesthood tribe, the Levitical priesthood, pretended like everything was fine when the Ark of the Covenant, which symbolized the presence of God, when it was not there in the Holy of Holies. Right? When, when Jesus was uh, walking on the earth, the Ark of the Covenant was not in the temple. So, it is possible for us to do church and pretend like everything is uh, awesome and and more than amazing without his presence uh, but imagine what uh, churches would look like with his presence and if we made jesus a central focus right imagine a community of whom it can be said god is in their midst right god is in their midst healing and deliverance divine provision everything else that we need for life will be experienced by everyone who is part of such a community. Amen. Right? Healing and deliverance, divine provision and everything else that we need for life will be experienced by everyone in, in, who is part of such a community. And immediately I'm thinking of the time of the Israelites in the wilderness. For how beautifully God provided for them. Right, uh, supernatural, uh, divine miracles. Um, everything that they ever needed was provided for them in the wilderness. And and this doesn't stop there. As they kept progressing in the Joshua generation, the Canaanites, their enemy, had heard of what this God had done to the Egyptians. They had heard that this almighty God is with them that he goes before them right, with the, in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And so the word had spread kilometers, kilometers ahead that, hey, there is this people who is coming with whom that there is God is in their midst. And we heard of what he did to the Egyptian armies. Isn't that amazing, right? Um, so when God is in our midst, uh, everybody around us uh, will know that he is there because nobody can ignore his presence. Uh, his presence cannot go unnoticed. Right? I'm just uh, again reminded of that, uh, of this beautiful act of worship from the, that woman in the alabaster jar. She walks in as a sinner, as an adulterous woman in that, in that community, in that society. She, she's known for um, 
all the immoral immoral life that she's lived but she brings that alabaster jar she breaks it at the feet of jesus and she wipes his feet with her hair and then all of a sudden the atmosphere in the room changes uh, you know, the full room is filled with fragrance. And as she's walking by, just imagining that people in the room start begin to, uh, you know, talk. Is that fragrance coming from the feet of Jesus or is it coming from her hair? Right. Um, so the point here is that people will know, the world will know if you've been with Jesus and if Jesus has been with you. And if God is in your midst, amen. Um, so let's just look at Psalm 132, verse 13 and 18. It says, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. He has desired it for his dwelling place. Now that word desire there is not just like, okay, I want that. I want this. I need that. I desire for this thing. It's not just that. It's the same word that is used for Cain in Genesis. When you go back and read, it says, um, sin desires to consume him. That means it's it's just waiting to bounce on it and just consume all of it. That's what it's It's like a fire that's wanting to consume. And it will not be satisfied until it has it. And that's like, that's the desire it's talking about here is that he, he cannot wait until he has everything of it, until he wants to consume it. And that's what it says. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. For That's where he wants to tabernacle, his resting place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. Okay, so God chooses where he wishes to dwell where he causes his presence to abide. Okay, um, so let's break this psalm down, these few verses down, and see uh, what really happens to his people, right? to us, when God, when we learn to host his presence, when God is in our midst, when he, when he dwells, when he pitches his tent, in our midst. Okay, so this is what happens. Verse 15, it says, right, I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Means there is supernatural provision, prosperity and blessing. There is no lack for anything. Okay, in verse 16, I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Okay. I will clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There is salvation means there is forgiveness, there is healing, there is deliverance, victory, wholeness, total well-being. And the joy of salvation that resounds continually among us. Okay, I'm just, uh, I'm just reminded of this scripture. Let's, let me see if I can get that for us. Um a very popular scripture that we are all aware of. Zephaniah 3.17. Right? Zephaniah, put that in the chat section for us. Okay. The Lord your God is in your midst. Okay? A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Okay, when he's in our midst, look at uh, so, some, more, some more things that's happening when he's present. Right? Um, so, when, when he is there, he's, there is joy, there is, there is laughter, there is peace, there is total well-being, there is peace that passes all understanding because he is the prince of peace, the Bible says, isn't it? Um, and Rome is a, the God of peace should soon crush Satan. And God will crush him underneath. 
There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. So the horn symbolizes strength. Um, that you know that's what it means. So there is a continual increase of strength and dominion. There is continual revelation, a symbol for lamp. Right, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And there is a continual revelation. As his anointed people, we see continual increase in strength, dominion, and revelation. There is continuous revelation of who he is. We, well, you thought you knew his, you know, uh, you could only part the Red Sea. Well, just see how I'm going to provide for you, how I'm going to turn these bitter waters into sweet waters. You will see how I'm going to, you know, provide you with water out of a rock. Um, right? So, there's, there's going to be a constant revelation after revelation where you think I could only do this. Just wait until you see how I, you know, take care of you here and how I provide for you here, uh, etc., etc. Okay, uh, your sandals are not going to uh, are going to wear out in the wilderness. Uh, you know, so there is constant revelation. There is strength. There is dominion that is being released uh, when He is present. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon Himself. His crown shall flourish. We triumph over our enemies and continue to increase. Flourish and blossom as his people. We triumph over our enemies and continue to increase, flourish and blossom as his people. You know, once again, I'm just reminded of Psalm 23. Uh, you know, he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Um, we can dwell on that psalm, uh, that verse, an entire hour. Um, this is so rich in intimacy uh, of, of what it means, um, right? So this is what every local church can become. Every local church can become a community among whom God dwells where his healing, provision, salvation, joy, strength, dominion, revelation, and victory is established. Amen. Uh, how many of us would like to just see our churches uh, be like that, where we host his presence, and then where His we see his glory being manifested in your cities, in your nation, in your land? Yeah, are you believing for that? Amen. Can we believe for that? Can we press in? Yeah. I want to encourage you to believe in for that, uh, wherever you are. All right? Um, let's just move on. Um, and that leads us to this next point. It says, when the king is enthroned, his kingdom manifests. Okay? Verse, Psalm 22, verse 3. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. We've looked this verse in detail, um, you know, when we've, when we studied praise and worship, isn't it? Uh, you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. It says, when God is enthroned among us, his kingdom manifests. Right? Because the kingdom is two words, right? King and dominion. And just uh, in, in the previous psalm, uh, you know, we looked at his strength and his dominion increases when he's in our midst right so when the king comes he always comes with his dominion so that is why when god is enthroned when our king is enthroned his kingdom manifests right uh when god is enthroned the enemy is dethroned right his kingdom is his kingdom in one that overthrows the power of the works of darkness Sickness and disease, every demonic work bows as his kingdom advances. Right? So when God is enthroned, the enemy is dethroned. So as a local church community, we must move away from gathering around all the wrong things, around a superstar pastor, uh, around some denominational ideology, around some social or cultural commonality, and only gather to enthrone King Jesus. If, it was, if, if that was our only goal, if that was our only aim, 
to come together and to enthrone Jesus um, and not be fixated on the small trivial things. Uh, the things that can be done, the things that he will do is unparalleled. Like no eye has seen, no ear has heard what he has in store right, for his people. When he alone is praised, worshipped and enthroned, his kingdom will be established in our midst and his kingdom will manifest. Uh, we ought to pursue and go after his kingdom. Um, and it's no surprise that Jesus taught us to pray like the way he did. Right? Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To see heaven on earth is something that we ought to live for and strive for and, and encourage our congregation, our church to, uh, to live for, to pursue, to hunger for, to, des to be desperate for. Because that's the only thing that matters at the end of the day, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, and then when, when, when we are gathered together, his power ought to be there. 1 Corinthians 5, 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Right, so anybody, anybody can get together. Anybody can have, you know, come together, um, and and it is us gathering, coming together in His name, the different, uh, that different that kind of differentiates from every other get together that people can have, because people do that all over the world, isn't it? Having a get together and, and whatnot. Um, that's what separates a group from a community. There is a purpose. There is a vision. There is a goal. There is a focus. And that's the difference between a group and a community. Remember, we are talking about a local church as a community here. right? So God intended that we be a people who gather together in his name, with his power and, and presence overshadowing the gathering. Okay, we need to... Uh, you realize the importance and the power that there is uh, made available for us uh, in the privilege that he's given to use us his, use his name right um, we, we, we were again we've studied the power of his name uh, before in the previous chapters and whatnot but I want to remind us once again um, this is a very brief story of Paul uh, in the book of Acts where God tells Ananias uh, when Paul uh, this is after Paul had encountered uh, Jesus, and then he's blind now. And God tells Ananias, go and anoint um, him. When Ananias says, but I'm scared. He's the one who's uh, you know, persecuted the church. But God says, "Like no, go. I have chosen him to carry my name. Right? I have chosen him to carry my name. Right? And if you think about it, every brand in this world, uh, you know, every company, exists wants you to carry their name wants you to represent their name isn't it um like reebok or nike zara whatever we can go on like even the musical instruments um the sticks you use the strings that you buy everything everything every company wants you to kind of carry their name uh, but then here god says you know i have chosen he has chosen us uh, to carry his name Right? And we need to come to the realization and acknowledge uh, the privilege that's been given to us. Uh, and his name is more than just a name where we end a prayer with, where we say in Jesus' name. It's not just a formula that ends a prayer. Uh, when we say that we are gathered together in Jesus' name, when, it, when the Bible says that he is in the midst, that gathering should look like the gatherings in the day of Jesus when he was present. What, what, what it would look like, what he would say, what would he do. That's what our gatherings ought to look like when we gather together in his name. Amen. Um, so the degree of glory, power, and anointing that we can carry as a community is so much more than what just one of us can carry individually okay there is 
power in coming together. There is power in unity. Um, there's power in corporate worship. Uh, and I'm sure we've realized that during the course of the pandemic um, is we've all lacked the coming together. And then there's like this beautiful breath of fresh air when people come to people you know, come together in his name, lift our hands up and declare together in unity. Uh, there's something powerful about it, isn't it? Um, right? So there is uh, the degree of glory, power and anointing that we can carry as a community is so much more, is so much more than what just one of us can carry individually. Right? There is no limit to this. I'm moving on to, into the next section. God is among us. First Corinthians 14, 24, 25 says, But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. When an unbeliever comes and sees and encounters his presence, um, he, is, he does not go back the same, isn't it? So uh, just quickly, let's read what it says. Where the Holy Spirit moves and his gifts and power are manifested, people will repent, worship God, and say that God is truly among us. When will we have services and gatherings where we are not where we are not out to impress people with our slick presentation and use of technology? Rather, we depend on the raw power of the Holy Spirit to touch lives, see sinners repent, people healed, and devils cast out. Our impressive programs, media presentations, and the use of technology cannot achieve this. Only the presence and power of God can we need to become such a community of believers where when an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in they are so impacted by the power of god that they fall on their face worship god and say that god is truly among us amen i don't need to expand on that but but that is our heart's desire that's that ought to be our desire it's my desire is when people come to church um, and when someone wants to be prayed for um, and who's expecting a miracle, I don't want them to come and simply meet a Roshan and go back. I want them to encounter the God of the universe in me and, and then go back. And that way, they just didn't come and meet a person, but they came and met their creator and their lives were changed and they went back. That's what uh, we need to hunger for and desire uh, more of in our churches, that, that he is among us and we, and we want people to see uh, the fruits of the Spirit in us. Right? And people will come where Jesus is. So uh, we see that in Matthew chapter 4, the last verse, verse 25, great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Acts chapter 5, it says, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities of Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. They were all healed. As the point of these verses is the testimony of what God does, what Jesus did, always traveled. 
Right. And from the time when we read about the women with the issue of blood, where she touched the hem of his garment and she was healed, the news of that traveled. And if you go back, this, if you go back to that uh, gospel, I think it's in the book of Gospel of Matthews. I'm not, I'm not sure, but at least two chapters after that incident, you will see a blind person just crying or saying, can I just touch the hem of his garment? How did he know that? Because I'm sure he heard of what had happened of, to this woman. So the testimony of what, he, what had happened spread. And that's why a great multitude followed him. Right? And then in the book, in Acts chapter 5, we see that people just just waiting and longing for Peter's shadow to fall on them. Why? Because they heard that his shadow had healed uh, the person who was waiting at the temple. Amen? Wait, so when God is in our midst, uh, when, his, when his kingdom is being manifested, the news of what he is doing will spread and people will come. People will not come to our churches because we have fancy equipments or how big or how small um, our buildings are. People will come to encounter his glory. Because it's in our DNA. We all, you know, it's, uh, that's what we are longing for. We are all longing. Every single human being is longing for, for their creator. They just don't know that it's Jesus. Okay. Uh, are you guys with me so far? Yeah. I hope you are. Uh, the section says, when Jesus ministered, he never had a promotional campaign, advertising agency, or mass media propaganda. Yet great multitudes came. They came because Jesus was preaching, healing, delivering, working signs and wonders. They came to hear and to be healed. They came because the power of God was being manifested in healing and deliverances. They came to experience this for themselves. They carried their sick, hurting, demon-possessed, and brought them to where Jesus was. They came with faith in their hearts. Okay, uh, They came with faith in their hearts. Uh, just Think about that faith, you know, when Jesus was going from one city to another city. And if you know anything about the geography of, uh, the, of the Middle East, it's not always lush, green, beautiful, but you have to pass through a lot of wilderness, dry areas. And imagine the faith of these people who carried the sick in that hot sun, the Middle Eastern sun. And follow Jesus. That that such was their hunger, um, such was their desire to encounter His presence. And guess what? People are no different today. Right? They will come to where the same Jesus is. The question is: Do we have the same Jesus in the church today? And that ought to wreck our hearts. Do we have the same Jesus in our churches today? Um, does that do anything to you? That Does that question stir your heart? Does that make you uncomfortable? It should. Just to go back and ponder and reflect. Man, do we have the same Jesus that the Gospels are talking about? Bill Johnson says it the best. He says, Bible study without Bible experience is waste. I should say I agree. Bible study without Bible experiences is waste. We ought to strive and hunger for more of that, right? Mm -hmm. So taking his presence and power everywhere. Acts chapter 6, verse 8, another story of another apostle here. It says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And who was this Stephen? Uh, let's take a look at it. Okay, The local church was never intended to be a gathering around a denominational ideal. 
it was intended to be a dwelling place of god where every individual was graced with the presence and power of god every individual not just the leaders or elders or pastors but every individual every believer is to demonstrate god's glory through releasing his power in signs and wonders and like stephen ordinary believers serving food or doing other simple things are to be full of faith and power and do great wonders and signs right he was serving food to the widows to the greek speaking widows probably he spoke greek even but see what the scripture says he was full of faith and power the sequence of the choice of words is very important we just can't read it okay full of faith and power the progression of it it was full of faith and power how many times in this course have you read uh, read about the importance of faith it's like a springboard that that launches us to god's power right and it also reminds us that like we've been learning from day 1 every believer can do this every believer in your church ought to manifest and walk and walk in in signs and wonders that's what we ought to strive for and in doing that you encourage your church members it, you know it doesn't matter what you are there to volunteer as but you are there to more than anything else to manifest his presence you might be there arranging chairs cleaning the chairs cleaning the toilets the bathrooms whatever rolling the cables setting up the sounds uh you know whatever it may be we are warriors in his kingdom we are vessels called to manifest uh, his glory around people around us amen um so press in for more there is great price to pay to be an instrument that god can use to manifest his power on the earth very few take this road however we must walk this path it says the disciple should not be above his master but he shall be like his master but if we are to be like him in power we must also be like him in holiness consecration meekness and compassion we must be like him in prayer and fellowship with the father we must be like him in faith we must be like him in fasting and self denial if it were possible for the servant to be like him in power without paying the price he paid then the servant would be above his lord It's by evangelist a a allen right are we willing to pay the price as individuals as a, as a corporate as as a local church are we willing to pay the price and making his present presence our corporate desire psalm 63 verse 1 and 2 o oh god you are my god early will i see my soul thirsts for you my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water so i have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory i have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory we must make his presence our corporate desire okay. we must make his presence our corporate desire we must come eagerly expecting to see his power and glory each time we are together in a lot of sunday services in our small home groups or even when we get together as two or three whenever wherever and whenever we meet we must be hungry and thirsty for him we must long for him his presence power and glory we must long for the spirit of god to demonstrate his power amongst us and through us so that lives can be changed the sick can be healed people delivered and god glorified Amen. Uh, that's the end of uh, chapter thirteen. Um, chapter fourteen is uh, is a record of everything what Jesus did, um, and I would 
encourage you to uh, go through this chapter. Uh, it's, once again, it's very small, but then it records everything, uh, every miracle of Jesus and how Jesus ministered. It's in a simple table format. Um, can I encourage you to please go through it, uh, you know, um, at home after the class is done, right? Um, and I'll stop here, really. Um, and the last chapter, chapter, chapter 15, is all about another reminder of, of what we are called to do. We are encouraged to do, and we are his, uh, we are his hands, we are his feet um, to this world. We are his mouthpiece to this world. Um, we are called to go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. That's what we are commissioned to do as well. Okay, um, so with that, we actually conclude uh, this course, guys. Um, it seems like uh, this today will be our last class. And, um, and as mentioned, chapters 10, 11, and 12 will be, will be covered in your other courses in Believer's Authority, Demonology, and Deliverance, and Inner Wholeness in the next semester. Okay, um, and uh, I hope this course has been an encouragement uh, in, and it's been an inspiration for you to uh, walk in the fullness of God um, and, uh, and stirred your heart to love people because God loves his people and he wants to see, it is his will uh, to see his, pe his people uh, healthy without sickness, uh, to see his people strong and, and full of peace. Amen. Um, so that's about it. Uh, any thoughts, any questions, anything that you guys want to share before we close and conclude? Uh, Pastor, uh, I just want to ask something regarding the sign-in. Okay. Uh, like... Uh, the book summary uh, one second can i just stop the recording because uh, the assignment is very different for the e-learning people so, so i don't want them to get confused so i'll stop the recording and we'll have this conversation okay